Come on. Uh, gotta get these reviews done. The hell? Oh, mother. What's going on everybody? Well welcome to my Nightmare on Elm Street review series. I'm going to start with the original 1984 classic, work my way all the way up to the most recent remake, and then I'll end in a ranking video. I shouldn't have to say this, the movie's over 30 years old, but if you have not seen A Nightmare on Elm Street, this will be a spoiler review. So pause this video, go back and please watch A Nightmare on Elm Street, then come back and finish. On November 9th, 1984, the nightmare began. A Nightmare on Elm Street, directed by Wes Craven, came out and to date is still one of the best classic horror movies. A Nightmare on Elm Street tells the story of a group of teenagers who are plagued nightly by horrific nightmares where they are chased by a burned man in a red and green sweater with knives for fingers and they quickly find out that if they die in the nightmare, they die for real. People, the original A Nightmare on Elm Street is still to date one of my favorite horror movies and one of my favorite movies of all time. I'm so glad to finally be talking about this movie and I have no idea where to start. So let's just go ahead and start with the man himself. Freddy Krueger to me has always been my favorite of the horror icons. From Jason, Pinhead, Leatherface, all those guys, Freddy is the man, he always will be the man, and he was never done better than he was in the original 1984 Nightmare on Elm Street. Freddy Krueger was a child pedophile and murderer who was burned alive in his boiler room by all the parents of his victims, and then he came back as some sort of dream demon so that he can stalk and kill the remaining kids of Elm Street. Everything about Freddy is just so iconic, to the burns, to the beat up fedora, the red and green Christmas sweater, even down to the most iconic and recognizable weapon in horror history. Oh yeah. The look and the concept of Freddy Krueger actually came from a childhood memory of Wes Craven where he looked out his window and he saw this homeless man in a fedora and I believe a jacket or a, some kind of a trench coat walking around and it looked really ominous and he felt Wes Craven's eyes on him and just looked at him up in his window and he jumped back and whenever Wes Craven as a kid looked back on the window he was still staring at him. And Freddy's name actually came from a high school bully of Wes Craven so it always fascinates me how much of Wes Craven's life he put into this story and into this character. Kind of a fun fact too, this is the only Nightmare on Elm Street movie where there's no stripes on Freddy's sleeves, it's just a solid red. In the later sequels, Freddy got a lot more comedic, he got a lot more campy, but in the original Nightmare on Elm Street, he was scary as hell. He was used very minimalistic, he's only in like seven minutes of the entire runtime of the movie. He's always in the shadows, he's always got a silhouette going in the background, he's just silently stalking people, and even when he's really maniacal, it's never campy. He's just sinister. And one element of Freddy Krueger that's always been an extra level of creepy because it's just so not talked about is the pedophilia and the sexual abuse side of Freddy Krueger because this movie came out and it was supposed to be very heavy on the murderer and the pedophile side but it was in such a time of controversy where there was a lot of real life cases about pedophilia and about child abuse that the movie did not want to go away with that stain of kind of playing into that controversy and that really tragic thing that everybody had on their mind so they really downplayed the sexual abuse sides of everything and it made it even scarier because now it's just subtext now it's just a small little thin layer that's there that's not right up in your face you just kind of detect it a little pieces here and there like from the way he moves his tongue it's just a layer of Freddy that's never really been up in the forefront up in your face until the remake but it's always really creeped me out whenever it does kind of bleed through. Everything that Robert Englund brought to that character in the original movie is just amazing. Everything that he did, from the voice to the way that he walked, to the way that the glove kind of leaned over to the side from the weight and he just kind of had this swagger to him, everything that he brought to him, let's be honest, no one's ever gonna top that. Something I actually noticed for the first time when I just rewatched this movie is that Freddy actually has kind of a transformation in this movie. When you first see them the first two or three times, He's very clown-like, he's very goofy, he has this maniacal laugh to him, he's very light-spoken, but throughout the movie, the more fear that it embodies him, the more people that he takes out, the more iconic that that name, Freddy Krueger, gets in Elm Street, he gets more demonic, he gets a little bit darker, his voice gets darker, he gets deeper, he gets scarier, 
And that's the only movie I can think of where he goes through that transformation. The whole theme of fear is just synonymous with Freddy Krueger. That's what he dishes out. Fear is what gives him power. It's what fuels him. And there is plenty of fear to spread around in A Nightmare on Elm Street. Starting off with the first victim to succumb to fear in the nightmare is Tina. What a great red herring. The movie starts off and you're following Tina for the first 15 minutes of this movie and it basically puts you into the mindset that okay this is our main character, this is our star, this is going to be our final girl, this is the one that we're going to follow through this story, she's the one who's eventually going to conquer over evil and possibly make it into the sequel. Nope dead in the first 15 minutes. Which was such a genius move by Wes Craven in this movie, is just totally pulling the rug out from the audience and killing what you thought was the main girl immediately. And it's actually something that he repeated again, probably even better, in Scream. And what a brutal death that Tina has. One of the most iconic and really, for the time, one of the most innovative deaths that you've ever seen on the screen for a slasher movie. She gets cut open, she's floating around in midair, she's dragged across the ceiling, and then falls and lands in a giant pool of blood. Just wicked stuff. One of the most brutal deaths in the Nightmare series. And to date, that's probably the one that is still the most iconic. It's the most talked about, it's the most remembered, and is one of the best ones out there. And with Tina out the way, we have our main character, Nancy, played by Heather Langenkamp. One of the most underrated by far of the heroines and the final girls in slasher movies because Nancy kicks ass. And that was actually Wes Craven's intention. He didn't want to have the same old stock victim in a slasher movie where they're falling over themselves and they're just crying and screaming and running around. He wanted a heroine who could fight back and Nancy is that heroine. Just like Freddy, she kind of goes through this transformation throughout the movie too. When she first comes out of the scene, she kind of has that typical stock victim flavor to her. You don't really expect too much out of her. She doesn't seem to have a whole lot of strength to her. She just seems like a victim. But throughout this movie, the more that she's tormented by Freddy, the more that she keeps succumbing to the nightmare, the more that she sees people get killed, and she's just so helpless to help the situation and to vanquish this evil, the stronger she gets. And she's one of the only heroines you're ever going to find in a horror movie that says, I'm tired of this shit, and takes on the killer head first and whoops his ass. A Nightmare on Elm Street is one of the few 80s slasher movies that I can watch and I can honestly say that the acting is really good. A Nightmare on Elm Street came out in a time when slasher movies were very popular. They were a dime a dozen and yet you have this movie come out that's a total breath of fresh air, completely breaks the mold and almost reinvents the genre all in one. And that is 100% thanks to the genius of the late Wes Craven. There's so many aspects of this movie that is just complete genius. When you have a slasher movie, there's always some kind of an evil or a threat. But in Nightmare on Elm Street, it's probably the most relatable threat that they've ever put on screen up to that time because it's something that everybody in the entire world can relate to. Everybody's had nightmares. And what makes it even scarier is that that's something you cannot escape. Eventually, you have to sleep. It's not a killer that you can keep out running. It's not an evil that you can keep just getting away from and getting away from and avoiding. Eventually, you're going to drop you're going to succumb to the nightmare and your ass is grass. Wes came up with the entire concept of a nightmare on Elm Street when he was reading some articles about a kid, I believe he was in Asia, that was just continuously having these nightmares and was refusing to go to sleep. The parents were putting him through therapy, was giving him sleeping pills, and he just would not want to go to sleep. He was hiding his sleeping pills. He had a little Mr. Coffee machine hid underneath his bed for when his parents went to sleep, and this kid eventually succumbed to his sleep, just like the threat that I was talking about. They put him upstairs, put him in bed. Minutes later, he's screaming and convulsing on the bed. They got to him, he was dead. It just gives me chills thinking about that. If I had something in my dreams that I was trying to avoid, if I could not go to sleep, if I was petrified to sleep, how do you win? There's no winning. And it's that one element right there about an unavoidable evil paired with the genius direction of Wes Craven in this movie that really set this apart from all the other slashers. It really was more of a psychological horror movie than a slasher. Nancy just had a lot of layers to her that you weren't used to seeing in slasher movies. You know, she's dealing with the death of friends. She's dealing with really bad parents. One of them's a drunk. One of them's a sheriff and is never around. She's trying to convince everybody that this evil is out there, but nobody will believe her. And at the end of the day, she's likable and you relate to her right off the bat so you want her to make it out of that situation which is something that not every slasher movie has. Nancy's parents are played by Ronnie Blakely and John Saxon and what I always really gravitate to with their characters is the total denial that they are in 
that there's any threat whatsoever to their daughter. You have one parent that avoids all the problems by getting drunk and just pretending that it's not there. You have another parent that buries himself into his work. Something that I always thought about when I looked at those two parents as well is that they seem to have a lot of signs of grief. And when they finally do admit their partaking and their accomplice into this vigilante justice that took out Freddy Krueger while he was alive, that I've always thought that maybe they had a kid before Nancy and that kid got murdered, that's why they got into it, and that's why they've been separated, that's why one drinks all the time, that's why one stays away from his family. It's always been a question that I almost want somebody to answer. The movie doesn't suggest it really, the movie doesn't really even give hints towards it, but I've always kind of, maybe a little bit of fan fiction, held that in the back of my head that maybe that's why they are that way. Oh yeah, Johnny Depp's in this. I guess I better talk about him. So Nightmare on Elm Street was actually Johnny Depp's big break. This was his first role. This is what launched him into the career that we see him doing now, where he's playing a bunch of freaky-ass characters with Tim Burton, all thanks to Nightmare on Elm Street. So Johnny Depp, his character is basically the jock. And what's always been interesting to me about his character is that he's the only one of this group that does not have the nightmare. He's the one that does not know who Freddy is. He's the one who's in denial. He's the one who's not scared. He never gives any suggestion whatsoever that he knows what they're talking about, even through the end of the movie. He never recognizes it as truth. And next to Tina's death, he has the most iconic death in this movie arguably even more iconic than Tina's death. And to create the effect of Glenn's death, they actually reused the rotating room from Tina's death. They flipped the room upside down, had a hole in the bed, they poured gallons and gallons of this red food coloring and water to create this blood cyclone, but the water was so heavy at the bottom of the rotating room that it swung it to one side. Sparks started shooting out of the room from all the lights that they had in it. Crew members were getting swung off of this room while it was just blindly and wildly flying around. A lot of people almost got seriously injured or killed in that scene, but it was totally worth it because that's a badass scene and it's one of the most iconic scenes in the Nightmare franchise. One thing that's always bugged me a little bit about Glenn's death though is that if you watch the way that Freddy dispatches his victims, he always either makes it look like somebody else killed them or they killed themselves. And he's always kind of had that doubt, and it was to create the doubt in the parents while bringing up the fear of the kids because nobody believes that somebody's actually out there killing these people. Nobody believes that Freddy Krueger is real. And yet, in Johnny Depp's death and Glenn's death, he sucks him into a bed, shoots a blood cyclone all over the room, and the parents are supposed to believe that uh, nothing supernatural caused that. It's always bugged me a little bit. And honestly, that whole theme about Freddy framing other people or making it look like accents is kind of something that the series has stuck to and not stuck to so many times that it's not really a part of the Freddy canon. So I really don't hold this movie too hard against that one fact. It's just something that when I watch this one singular story, it's always stood out to me as a little bit of an inconsistency. The only other thing that always bugs me about this movie, which really just came from drama behind the scenes between Wes Craven and the producer Robert Shea, is the contradicting two endings that we have in this movie. You have the final confrontation with Nancy and Freddy where she finally realizes the way to vanquish the evil and to beat Freddy is to take away all of his fear, to no longer fear him, do not give in to the fear, and he's powerless. And that's such a great ending, and that was Wes Craven's vision for the ending of this movie is that she takes away his power through taking away the fear, she walks outside, and everything is back to normal. All of her friends are back, everything is bright and sunny, and you get this happy little ending. And even though happy endings aren't really something you see a lot in slasher movies, that's the perfect ending to this one story. But then they lead into this little tag at the end, this little hook to leave room for more sequels, for further stories, for Freddy Krueger to come back, and within two minutes after that great ending, all of a sudden, yeah, you didn't fix shit, Freddy's actually still alive, and your ass is done. The convertible top goes over the car, it's got the signature red and green stripes, Freddy takes over the car somehow, drives away with the kids, and yanks Nancy's mom through the window, presumably killing her, and it just doesn't quite fit for me. I wish Robert Shea would have shut his mouth, and I wish we would have got the original ending to this movie, because even though I love the fact that the, the series continued, obviously, for the sake of this one movie, the ending that Wes Craven wanted was the better ending because it doesn't really make sense that you find the one way to kill the monster, the one way to vanquish the evil, and then two minutes later, yeah, you didn't kill anything and now you're back at square one. The way that I try to view that ending just to make it a little bit better for my own viewing experience is that whenever she finally vanquishes Freddy and she walks outside, everything from the beginning of the movie up to that point was just one long nightmare for Nancy. And when she walks outside, 
that is the new beginning of this story. She walks out, and that is now the beginning of the nightmare. And one other element of a nightmare on Elm Street that's not talked about enough to me is the score. Everybody always talks about the Halloween score when they think scary movie scores, but a nightmare on Elm Street is right up there with Halloween. It might even rival it in my opinion because the creepy ass piano just going throughout this movie totally ups the creep factor, totally ups the scare factor in this movie, and it's one of the most underappreciated scores in horror movies to me. And yes, I'm aware my shirt is different. Now something new I want to do in these reviews whenever I'm talking about older movies, especially in these franchise reviews, is I want to pick my favorite scene and describe that scene and why I love it. Now being that we're in a horror movie, I'm actually going to pick my scariest scene. And the scariest scene in this movie to me, which a lot of people probably would not pick, they probably pick the first time Freddy comes out and chases Tina down that alleyway. The scariest scene to me is the scene whenever Nancy slowly starts to come into the nightmare while she's in school. Because school is one of those things to me, not only does it have this kind of small layer of creepiness there just because of the vast openness of it, but it's one of those places where you're supposed to feel safe. You're supposed to feel like you're secure there. You're supposed to feel like nothing can touch you at school. And Nightmare on Elm Street just totally takes away that security and puts you in the middle of hell in school. I love the whole scene when she hits the person in the hallway, the hall pass monitor, and then she slowly just starts getting deeper into the school and finds herself coming across Freddy's boiler room. And it's just, that scene always freaks me out, especially when I was younger because I was young and I was in school all day. So just the thought of being in my desk and watching my teacher teach and looking over to the right and seeing a girl in a body bag just... Ugh, it always creeped me out. So to wrap all this up, guys, A Nightmare on Elm Street is still one of the best horror movies that has ever been made. It's an absolute classic. There are so many iconic scenes in this movie that just stick in your head that you will never forget as long as you live and as many times as you watch this movie, you always appreciate seeing those scenes and those effects over and over again. We got introduced to what I think is the best horror icon that has ever lived, Freddy Krueger, one of the scariest and just most iconic people who have ever been in a horror movie. You have a lot of really rich and great memorable characters, some great performances, and tons of effects and innovation in this movie that even 30 plus years later still I marvel at when I watch it. And you have a relatable and terrifying premise in this movie about running from a nightmare that no matter how long this movie exists, no matter how many people continue to watch this for the first time, it is always going to scare people. I will always have a special place in my heart for A Nightmare on Elm Street and a special place on my shelf. So if you do not own A Nightmare on Elm Street, drop what you're doing right now, go out and buy it. So what do you guys think of A Nightmare on Elm Street? Please tell me you've seen it before. If you haven't, comment down below so that I can ask you about your priorities in life. Is Freddy your favorite horror icon? Is Nightmare on Elm Street the original your favorite? What do you love about this movie? What is your most memorable scene, the scariest scene? Put everything that you want to talk about regarding A Nightmare on Elm Street down in the comment section below and we'll talk about it. And keep an eye out because I'm going to continue to review the rest of the Nightmare on Elm Street series. You'll see Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2 Freddy's Revenge very soon. So please like and share this video and hit that subscribe button. That way you get to come back and check me out and check the Nightmare on Elm Street review series as it continues.